All right. Oops. So here's tonight's panel. Um, they will each be introducing themselves to you. Um, really want to thank them. It's starting to get to be the busy time of year um, for, for landscapers. And so thank them for taking time out to be with us. We've got Catherine Kane from Southwest Montana down near Dillon and Glen, Beth McFawn from the Bozeman area, Linda Iverson from Big Timber, Shiva Soleimanian from Whitefish and Giles Thalen from Missoula. Now, I really want to point out that although we have these five folks gathered here, we have a host of other professionals around the state, and we don't mean to leave anyone out. And so if anyone's on here tonight um, and you want to introduce yourself in the chat and mention your line of work and the region you work in, we would welcome um, that introduction. You could put your website or contact info. Um, it'd be helpful to our audience and a, a great way to um, connect if you're involved in, um, in native plant landscaping. All right. Well, with there, I'm going to unshare my screen so we can see the just see the participants. We hope I can unshare the screen. There we go. <laughs> All right. Now where's Shiva? She's right down here on there. the bottom. Yeah, on the bottom. <clears throat> Next to you. Oh, I need to spotlight Shiva. So Let's see, add the spotlight there. All right. Yeah. yeah, yeah great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so um, here's our plan. We're slated to go to about 8 30. Um, each of the panelists is going to address a couple questions. Um, and then after that, those are questions from me. And then we'll address we'll address a bunch of pre-submitted questions. We had a lot of interest and people have um, submitted questions. And then we'll go to the audience um, if there's time after that. We'll take your questions from the audience. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, so for you panelists, first off, um, we'll go alphabetically, I guess. It's just easiest. But I'd like you each to take five minutes to introduce yourself and your work um, and share some of your favorite tips and advice and things you like to share about um, native landscaping. So um, Catherine, you can go ahead and start. OK. Hi, everyone. I want to introduce myself. I'm Catherine Kane. I'm a member of the Calypso chapter of the Montana Native Plant Society. I started my business, Southwest Montana Native Landscapes, in 2007. I started as a retail nursery of just native plants and also doing landscaping with native plants. Um, I have a passion for native plants. I love them. And I've had that all my life. I, I grew up in California and then I moved to Montana and I was originally a member of the California Native Plant Society and then in Montana Native Plant Society. And so just some tips for you if you want to get started on growing native plants. There are some things you need to do and your homework's really important because the more you are prepared, the more successful you're going to be. You just, it's not an instant thing. You have to really think about it and plan and then you'll be really happy with the results. So you need to research your location and know your growing zone and growing zones depend upon the lowest temperature during the winter for the most part. And so we used to be a zone three where I am in Southwest Montana, and now we're considered a zone four. So, but it's just something, if you look at labels on plants, often they'll say the, the zone, and you should be familiar with that term. You, you also need to know your annual precipitation, and this includes both snow and rain, your precipitation. And for instance, in the last decade in Dillon, it has gone from 16 inches to 10 inches. That's just in 10 years. So we talk about global warming and some of the effects are moving faster than others. And so you have to look into the future and say, okay, if it's gonna be getting, we're gonna have longer periods of summer, uh, longer periods of warm weather, our winters are gonna get shorter, you know, what am I looking at? So you need to plant accordingly to take that into account. So uh, another thing is, uh, factors such as wind, you need to think about wind and where your storms come, especially your severe weather events. Like sometimes we have in the center, 
in the summertime, I'm sorry, here in Southwest Montana, we get these big wind events. Um, we get uh, incredible hailstorms, and we've even had two tornadoes where I am. I never thought I would live in Montana and have to see a tornado in southwestern Montana, but we've had two come at our house. So um, you have to think about the direction they're coming from and then maybe plant accordingly. And some things that are maybe more tender, you wanna plant in them in protected areas. Uh, you need to consider your herbivores. Uh, I have deer, elk, moose, pronghorn, rabbits, voles, mice, and the one I'd never thought about when I started planting was pack rats. And you, need, you can get plants that are not pal palatable to some of those herbivores. So there are plants that are available that you can plant and you don't have to worry so much about them. Um, pack rats are a problem because they just pick off the blooms. And I know they're around when I, my columbines start blooming and all the columbines have been neatly nipped off and they're lying on the ground, pack rats. So uh, you need to plan for microclimates within your planting areas and you think about like microclimates are just areas where it's maybe a little bit different as far as temperature. Uh, maybe it's warmer, it's more protected. Maybe it's colder because it's more exposed. So you can like in back of rocks or in back of a hill, if you vary your terrain in your planting areas, you'll have more microclimates and that gives you more variety of things that you can plant. Uh, you need to use your local resources. And one of those, uh, one of the, in Montana, we're very lucky because we have an MSU extension, extension agent for every county in Montana. And they have all kinds of resources available to you and publications. And also the Montana Native Plant Society, we were talking about our site online. You can learn about how doing all kinds of things as far as planting and like how to get rid of a lawn or where, or where you can buy native plants in your area. It's a really great resource. And also the online site of the Montana Native Heritage Program in Helena is very good too, with descriptions of all the different plants and gives you specifications about the plants. So uh, I believe personally that variety is the spice of life and that the more variety you can have when you plan your um, planting of natives is important. I like colors kind of in big blocks. I don't, I don't like dots everywhere. I like things where you maybe have um, three to seven of, of each species of plant, kind of plant in a block so you get blocks of color. I like variety in textures. Think about leaf textures, leaf colors, grays versus green versus hairy things. Um, that, and then like, for instance, I'm in such a windy area that I tend to pick things that are lower in height because those, those work better. So um, there's a lot of things like that, the little details, and you can, you can vary your, the, you start with a flat site and you can vary it just by putting a lot of rocks in and hills and things and, and making it um, very different from what you started with. So anyway, good luck and on to the next. Linda? All right. Well, hi, and thanks for, for tuning in tonight and thanks for your interest in native plants. Um, I'm Linda Iverson. I live northeast of Big Timber, where I'm really lucky to live in an area. I have a small ranch that's surrounded by native vegetation. I have lots of open prairie with lots of blue bunch wheatgrass and western wheatgrass and all kinds of wonderful mm -hmm. forbs that bloom. Um, and I have a forest with ponderosa pines and junipers and ancient, ancient old trees. So I am super lucky and I think that's been a huge inspiration for me. Uh, in my business as a landscape designer. Um, I mostly work in South Central Montana. Um, I've done a huge variety of landscaping over the years, um, residential, commercial, but I think really what my favorite um, kind of landscaping to do is where I seed back the native grasses and wildflowers into what I call kind of wildscapes. Um, in both rural and urban settings. Um, I think it just reminds me of home. So it's um, been my passion. Um, so I'm gonna give you a few tips on that, on kind of seeding uh, grasses and wildflowers, native ones. Um, so the first tip is to learn the plants. And um, I didn't have a big background in botany. And so I learned all about native plants from the Montana Native Plant Society. And I went on numerous field trips and listened to botanists describe how to identify plants. And so that was my background and how I got familiar with plants. So that's a great recommendation to you to learn 
uh, plants. Um, and the other, another tip is that this takes time. Re revegetation is not instant. It's not rolling out bluegrass. Um, it takes up to three years to really establish a community of grasses and wildflowers. Um, and so you need to know that that's gonna be the timeline you'll, you'll wanna plan for. Um, and also, um, I, I recommend you start small, especially if you're renovating um, like a already existing landscape, just take a little section at a time rather than the whole thing um, and try to phase the landscape in. Um, and that brings me to the fact that mm -hmm. in order to do this kind of wildscaping with native grasses and wildflower seeding, you have to remove the existing foliage or you have to get rid of it or they can't compete. So if you built a new home or something that's already done for you, but if you're working on existing landscape, um, you need to remove that, um, that those plants, however you do it. Um, that has to be done before you can really start. So that that's a, a thing to factor in. Um, and if you, um, I mean, and also I guess mm -hmm. in thinking about that, um, about this whole thing is that you can't replicate exactly what you've seen out there in the wild. You're not gonna get that same look. It's gonna be your own version. And so I have a lot of fun with it. I sometimes even add non-natives, um, but um, I just use a variety of plants and um, some of them seed, some of them are planted. Um, but the main thing is diversity and you're getting away from that monoculture of lawn where you're just having one kind of plant, there's no broad leaves, you're constantly fertilizing and watering. Um, so that's, that's important to remember. And also the maintenance. Um, a lot of people think native, this kind of native landscaping, native wild lawns are no maintenance, but they're actually K-N-O-W maintenance. You have to know how to take care of it. Um, and so a lot of it is watering, you know, knowing how to water, kind of replicating nature and doing the deep soak and then letting things kind of dry out in between. That's what they like. Um, a lot of people think you don't mow and that's, that's kind of a myth because you need to mow like in the establishment phase um, in order to keep all that, that initial growth of weeds down to, so it won't compete with all your little seedlings. So mowing is important then and also mowing to um, control height sometimes is important, especially if you live in town. And, and then also mowing to um, to remove the foliage of the season's growth. But um, but all in all, it's a wonderful way to bring you know, nature back into town or to blend into your rural surroundings that may be already native instead of having just this lawn and then the native. Um, it's a wonderful way to kind of buffer. Um, it's a great place for wildlife and pollinators. So I, I highly recommend it, even though it, it does take extra time and, and passion. <laughs> so hopefully that that uh, will help you. <clears throat> okay. Hey, Beth. Hi, yeah. I'm Beth McFawn uh, in Bozeman. Uh, I've been in the landscape business since 1998. Um, I moved out here to go to school at MSU for the landscape design program. And my passion is natives, just seeing the textures and the colors and the variety. Um, and that's my focus, but not solely. Um, and I wanted to share just a few of, it was hard to narrow it down, but I wanted to share a few of my favorite um, native perennials, um, one of which is a cleome. It's an annual, um, cleome serulata. Um, it's a lovely uh, late summer blooming bee loving blossom. And it's an aggressive cedar. If you uh, water it too much, it can um, set its seed for the next season quite readily. Um, but the bees love it. 
and it has a very um, unique leaf form. Um, so I also use a lot of different textures in, in my designs, um, trying to replicate um, the native grasslands and, and prairies. And uh, another favorite of mine is Pearly Everlasting, uh, Anaphilis. Um, and it dries really nicely in, in the fall. So if you're looking for uh, any bouquets or dried arrangements, it's a great one. It's rhizominous, so it spreads quite readily. It's not very drought tolerant. It does, it can um, tolerate some inundation of, of water. Um, and then another favorite of mine is um, the spotted gay feather, um, Liatris punctata. And it's a lovely, dry, drought tolerant, um, late blooming summer uh, blossom that again, the bees love. It's a great pollinator plant. And it <clears throat> has a really nice vertical form, um, which is a nice addition of shape in, mm -hmm. in, a, in a landscape. Um, another one is the milkweed. Um, uh, Asclepsius speciosa. Uh, it can uh, tolerate uh, an inundation of water and then dry out. And it has a big, bold leaf. So it also has great form. And it's, as you many of you may know, is the food source for the monarch butterflies. Um, and the seed pod is quite lovely in, in the late fall uh, kind of uh, winter landscape. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll switch over to Shiva. All right. Hi, everybody. First of all, um, I agree with what everyone before me has said. I'm just nodding my head being like, yep, 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 and yep. <laughs> um, I kind of just came up with a list of the first things that came to my mind when um, considering native uh, plant landscape design. And really one that everyone has touched on is just familiarizing yourself with native species and with your site. I feel like every time I think about what would I tell people, this is always what I come back to. It's like very difficult to plan something if you don't know what you're dealing with. So um, familiarize yourself with bloom time, color, height, spread, soil needs, sun requirements, its growth habit. Um, what is your site like? What's um, the drainage like aspect light mm -hmm. again it just can be difficult to plan something without knowing the plants first which i realize takes some time but um i uh i guess i forgot my intro but <laughs> i work for a company <laughs> called for restoration up in whitefish montana mm -hmm. and we also run a native plant nursery called the center for native plants um, I mostly do uh, residential landscape design, um, as well as occasional projects with community groups and schools or the city. And um, our website, the Center for Native Plants.com, is one of my greatest resources. I recommend anyone and everyone wanting to learn about native plants. It's such an awesome tool. We've been creating a library of our species that we carry and um, signs that go with it. So you can click on them and it gives a picture and talks about all the things that I just mentioned, like bloom time, color, um, habit, um, pollinator, everything. So that's um, where I have learned, honestly, a lot <laughs> and refer to every day. So um, Continuing with advice, I think it's really good to create goals. Um, I find, you know, anyone and everyone can be like, I want to create a garden, but then it's hard to know what exactly you should do with a space. Um, I think you should actually think about what you want out of your landscape. Do you want to create a pollinator garden, a rain garden, provide food and habitat? Do you want to surround your patio with certain colors and textures? Just think about 
what you actually want out of the space and how you want to use it. Um, uh, my next one is patience, which a couple people have already touched on already. I really think that native plants can be slow to get established and bloom um, when you're starting from scratch. But uh, one really successful method that we've had um, is if there's already an intact uh, native plant community and you're planning to either build a new home or create something fresh. If it's some for some reason that site has to get disturbed and altered, one thing we'll do is go in and harvest native sod chunks and set them aside, water them, take care of them until the build site is pretty much completely finished. And then the last piece that goes in is the plants and we'll actually put those native plant communities back in place it's like one of the quickest ways that you can that you can kind of get that instant ish landscape but i mean i still don't really like using that term because it still takes time for them to establish and you know there's shock from being moved and any disturbed site is probably gonna have some presence of invasive species so like linda mentioned like maintenance is is huge i think i tell a lot of clients that it's kind of like managing your expectations um, and what you think it'll work look like versus what it might actually look like and the time input involved to get it to be what you want to look like. Um, next, uh, I think it's important to, while you're learning about the plants, um, feel open to forming connections with them. I think um, forming connections with plants creates a connection with uh, creates connections with place. Take note of plants that you see when you're out on a hike or a bike ride. Take notes of smells or feelings. I feel like a lot of my favorite plants that I recognize the most and can remember the names the best of are ones that I knew as a child or that I just have seen over and over again or I've had some sort of like olfactory experience with. <laughs> they say that um, Memory is very tied to smell. So I think fragrance is something that can help build our plant memory knowledge. Um, another thing that has already been talked about too is that um, Linda had mentioned that plants may behave differently in our yards than you would see in the wild. We have um, like a two-ish acre botanical garden that has natives and non-natives that we've been building for the last five years. And there's a whole native section. It's an incredible place. And it's some of the native plants, it, that whole site is receiving irrigation. And some of them are like gargantuan Godzilla plants. <laughs> and you would not see them like that anywhere else. So <clears throat> I think that's one thing to note too. Like, Hmm, why is this bee bomb like four feet tall? And then like, <laughs> see it out on the prairie, it's like a foot or whatever. Um, so yeah, okay. I, I don't know how much time I have left. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, uh, Shiva. And we'll move on to Giles. Hi folks, glad to be here. Um, it's been a fun exercise to think about kind of my history with plants and what I can share with everybody out there. And, you know, I moved to here for graduate school, like some of the other panelists back in 96. And then I got to work in Glacier in, in 99. And I, I was looking for frogs and salamanders in the back country there. And that was the first time I just remember being floored by native plants, gentians, especially uh, just sitting there for lunch and just being amazed at the gentians. And that was my first experience remembering ever seeing a gentian. Um, and I'm not gonna remember the species, darn it, I should have looked it up, but the elephant head plant, I don't know if you've ever seen one of those, but in Two Medicine, I remember seeing one, I'm like, that looks just like an elephant head. And I looked it up and sure enough, that's a common name. And I just, I remember that day and it makes me remember everything about that day, just that one plant next to a beaver dam in the, in the Two Med. And so that's, and then I was able to come and work for the University of Montana's plant ecology mm -hmm. lab for 11 years. And during that time, I started Native Yards, trying to rescue native plants from the housing developments in the hillsides around Missoula. And of course, 
to do something like that, you need a pretty full scale operation. So it turns into landscaping and restoration and, and, and just promoting native plants is what I say I do. I promote native plants and, um, and, and that's what a great way to spend, spend your days and to hang your hat on <laughs> something like that. Um, and so, you know, the questions you, I don't know if all the folks out there we were able to see, we've been asked you questions to kind of think about for you. And um, one is the work we specialize in and then a few of the most important tips or best advice we can give you all about native landscaping. Um, and so, you know, I think we all specialize in native plants. I'm kind of a design build guy. I'm a stick figure drawer, so I can see a picture in my mind's eye, but I can't really put it down on paper. So I just wave my hands a lot to potential clients. And a lot of times they trust me to, to put in a landscape. And what the other panelists have said about, about you know, managing expectations for native plant installations. And it's not very often we get a blank slate of being able to have a, a just fresh um, soil that you get to create something in. Um, and you never know where that soil comes from. These people have this, this bare earth and they're like, oh, what can we put? And little do they know that that bare earth came from some pasture somewhere, yeah. probably, and it's just loaded with weed seeds and everything else. And the incredible pulse, if they don't get to it right away, the incredible pulse of weeds they'll have will be overwhelming. And, and you know, that's where we come in and you, sometimes they wait a few years and then the seed bank is, is bad and all those things. And thinking about seed bank, I think that's something we all think about in terms of you know, we we're talking about establishing native plants. And part of that is for those native plants to be able to drop their seeds and procreate. And, you know, and something that I picked up in the research realm was there's kind of a key number for when you're planting native plants in terms of diversity. And it's like a 10 plants per meter. If you have a square meter and you have 10 plants and they're different plants and they can be ground covers or shrubs or trees or, or whatever, but I always try to target a real diverse number and that number is usually like 10 plants and what the research showed is that if you get that a minimum of that number of plants it really restricts the amount of invaders that can come in and so if you don't want weeds and you want to just you know do the the awesome thing that a lot of us native plant gardeners get to do now which is move your you know weeding native plants i've moved i've weeded so much smooth blue aster lately you know and it's like you want to keep them all, but it, but it you know there there's just too many, and so um, and so one of the other pieces of advice I'd like to throw out there is that patience. I'm you know my personal garden, which is only on three lots here in town, I have a ten year plan. I mean year nine of my ten year master plan, and it's been a pretty satisfying process. If you don't you know get down on yourself or if you see what we call garden cancer or campanula here that, you know, if you, if you see it in your yard, it's okay to, to have a little bit of that and that you'll get it, you know, next time. And so um, it's a process trying to create a, a you know, an, a sanctuary for, for yourself and for the critters out there. And, um, and so I, I think the best advice is, is diversity and patience and, and, knowing if you have a new situation that just keeping on top of the weeding, it's going to be pretty intense for the first season, but it'll, it'll decrease over time. Just like those beautiful Cleomies that Beth, that Beth mentioned, you know, they're awesome, but unfortunately they blink out in an established landscape over time, at least in mine. And they just find like the, the cracks and, and things like that. So um, I guess that's my two cents on, on, uh, on me and, and advice. Thanks. Great. Well, excellent advice from, from all you guys. Um, I know that's um, super helpful to me and I'm sure uh, everybody else. Um, next, I'm going to ask you each to talk about a few, if you haven't already, a few of your favorite workhorse native plants for your area and why you like them. And then also, if you care to share any favorite books or websites or other resources that you might have 
um, please do. And th then I will ask the panelists after you um, speak, it, it'll be helpful for the audience if you can write some of these things in the chat, if you have websites or anything that you want to share or your own website or whatever. Um, so we can go ahead and um, Catherine, you can start again. So you need to unmute yourself. Your little microphone. We can't hear you. Lower left. Yeah, for most people, for most people, it's lower, lower left on your screen. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Why don't we skip? Let's let you. We can't hear you, so we'll, oh, no, we'll here. okay. There we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> just gonna a little, message, a little message just came up that said unmute. I was clicking and clicking it. So anyway, sorry folks. Anyway, some of my favorite plants I'm gonna go through real quick. And I again you've got my uh, contact information on chat right now. So one of my very favorites is called the common twin pod, and it's in the mustard family, and it it's a kind of a high ground cover. And it's Fisaria didiomacarpa variety lanata. And it has beautiful little yellow blooms and, and the foliage is very gray and kind of triangular. And then the seed pods look just like popcorn. And when they dry out, they blow around your yard and it looks like popcorn blowing around your yard, except it's, it's spreading your ground cover. And it starts blooming usually in March, April, and it blooms until it, the snow flies, until it's covered with snow. And it kind of, it stays kind of evergreen all through the winter. And in the summertime, it goes through three to four cycles of that. We're blooming and then seed pods, blooming and seed pods. And it's totally delightful. I just love it. It's very favorite. Uh, another good ground cover is wild strawberries, uh, Fragaria virginiana. And it spreads rapidly by these red runners. And you get these really pretty little white flowers. And then it makes strawberries that if you can beat the mice to them, you can have them. Uh, I like to incorporate flowers and plants that pollinators love, and one that I really like in my area because it's so dry down here is silver scorpion weed, and it's Spacilia hostata, and it's great for bumblebees and wasps and our native bees. It has lavender flowers and really pretty silver foliage, uh, nice different kind of growth shape to it. I highly recommend that. Uh, another an annual that we've already talked about, a lot of us have talked about, is the bee plant, Cleome cerulata. And that's the one that Beth mentioned and Giles mentioned it. And it has magenta flowers and it's wonderful to plant around a vegetable garden or around your fruit trees. And because you're weeding around those areas, that tends to stay there for year upon year. It reseeds itself really well. It's an, it's a, it's an annual, but it reseeds itself very well. And uh, you'll get new plants every year. So that's a really good one. Um, for color, I love sulfur buckwheat, and that is Areogonum umbilatum variety aureum. And it has brilliant yellow blossoms with uh, gray foliage, and it, it's really attractive. It's very different. And I know that you would love that one, sulfur buckwheat. Uh, don't forget grasses. My favorite grass is Indian rice grass, and that's uh, let's see, Oryzopsis hymenoides. And it looks best if you plant it like a specimen plant. And so you put it out kind of by itself, maybe with other plants around it, but so it can full, fill out like a big basket. And it's really beautiful. It's one that the Native Americans use the seeds for to make flour out of, but it's very delicate looking. It's a great plant. It takes two years often to get established. So don't get frustrated. If the first year you don't see um, the grass plants coming up, often it takes two years, but it's worth it. It's worth the wait for. Uh, another thing I love is the deep magenta blooms and the silver hairy leaves of Bessie's local weed. Uh, it's Oxytropus bessii, and bumblebees and bees really love this plant. It's a good plant for your pollinators. And I'm gonna finish with what we know down here is Cowboy's Delight, and it's Spera alsia cocina. And it's a very common native in Southwest Montana. 
and it's also known as the scarlet globe mallow. Uh, its flowers are bright orange, and that's a great color to have in your garden. You have a lot of yellows, maybe some reds, but that bright orange is really nice. And it contrasts with it has grayish greenish foliage, foliage, and they say it's it's uh, it brightens every cowboy's day down here. So it's always been called cowboy's delight down here. And so I wish you luck with your plantings. And again, my contact information is on chat. So if you want, if you're interested in any of these, you can get to me, and I'll get back to you with the details. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right, Linda. All right. Um... Okay, so since I'm on the theme of seed and seeding landscapes, seeding native uh, landscapes, um, I, I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite grasses to seed and that is Idaho fescue. I've had a lot of luck with that grass, um, both in dry places and in places that have a little bit more moisture where you might be irrigating. Um, it's a, a good, uh, bunch grass, so it's not gonna spread with rhizomes and it's not gonna crowd out as much your other, your forbs. And um, it does have tiny little seeds. So you have a lot of seed per pound. So you wanna make sure when you seed that you seed quite lightly. Um, I, I measure out like a thousand square feet and I only use about a half a pound to a quarter pound. And even that's a lot. Um, and then add in the, the wildflowers to that. But I use that, if, you know, that's, that's kind of a monoculture grass, but I do use that sometimes by itself with the wildflowers. So. Idaho fescue, and then as far as the wildflowers go, um, there are three that have been the best for me over and over again, the big three, and you're probably really familiar with these, but one is blue flax, um, and the other, Linum louisii, uh, prairie coneflower, Retibita colonifera, and the blanket flower, which is Gallardia aristata. Those three are easy to grow, they're easy to get, you know, in the from seed dealers, um, they come back. Um, they they just perform really well for me. I use a lot of other forbs, but these three are the ones that are kind of the you know main ones. And I do reseed them after a few years because they're short lived, unfortunately. But they they continue to produce seed on their own. Plus, I I supplement, and then I do a lot of um, plants, other plants too. Um, like lupins and echinacea and monarda, pensnums, and some of them I actually plant in if they're kind of more difficult uh, to get to grow from seed. So those are my favorite plants. Um, I, of course, I have tons of others, um, but those are the ones I just for seed seeding, I would uh, recommend. And as far as references go, I was going to show you a couple books that I really like. This is called Prairie by Candace Savage. And this is not a how-to book or anything, but this is gonna give you an incredible uh, idea of how prairies evolved from the very beginning. And it kind of gives you an idea about time. Like you read this and you're like, oh, wow. Like I'm supposed to do this in one year. Like I need like a million years. <laughs> but anyway, so this is a really great book and I'll put it in the chat. And then a better sort of more how-to book. There isn't really a good one for our region yet. Um, I, I haven't found, but um, this is called Urban and Suburban Meadows by Catherine Zimmerman. And it has a lot of great practical um, illustrations and things about how to establish uh, seeded grass areas, seeded meadows and prairies, and a, a lot about maintenance too. So that one's a good one. Um, and also we have our Native Plant Society website where we have a landscaping uh, section. And in that section, we have um, some references that our chapters have done. Um, and our chapter in Bozeman um, had, had did one in 2008, and it has a lot of really good information. Some of it's outdated, some of the sources and things like that, but it has a great recommended species list with all the native plants that we feel are you know, in cultivation and um, a lot of information about their water needs and uh, growing needs and stuff like that. So that, those are good things to look at. And we also have our source guide, which is just recently updated. And that will give you uh, sources for seed, um, for seed dealers in the state. So that's a helpful thing to know as well. And we have general articles in there um, that I'm hoping that we'll keep adding to. So we'll have more specifics about some of the things we're talking about today. 
um, in written form. So you, you know, for, for just for Montana and just for our plants. Um, and right now there's a, a new one on water wise grasses um, that was just put out that is, I thought was very inf you know, informative. So, and also um, our Valley of the Flowers chapter is going to have a um, field trip on July 12th and I'm gonna lead it and it's gonna go to two of the landscapes I designed uh, one is at the Museum of the Rockies, where I did a small native garden. It's not seeded, sorry. Um, it's not seeded, but it's planted. And um, it has all my favorite native plants that are easy to grow are in that garden. And then also at Langer Park, um, I did a pollinator garden uh, quite a few years ago. And so you can kind of see a more mature um, planting. So anyway, those are two great ones to to see and hopefully maybe you can come to that field trip and I can talk more about native plants. Okay. All right, on to Beth McFawn. You have to unmute. Thank you, sorry. Um, one of the favorite natives that I forgot to mention was um, the uh, prairie smoke. Um, GM triflorum. It's got a beautiful like smoky red blossom that seed produces this beautiful airy uh, seed and then the uh, foliage in the autumn is beautiful reds and oranges and bronze. It's, it's, a, it's a great plant. Uh, and for resources, um, of course, the Montana Native Plant Society, we have great uh, resources, as Linda mentioned, under the landscaping uh, tab. Um, there's also one that I'll put on the chat. It's, um, it's based out of Wyoming. It's called, uh, it's a research and education group of regional um, professionals in the industry, but uh, there's a lot of research in the universities uh, around the region. So I'll put that on the website. It has a great plant uh, resource guide and descriptions of uh, specific um, growing habits uh, for, for native plants. And then as other people, panelists have mentioned, you know, understanding your soil is very important. And the NRCS has the web soil survey online. Uh, you can enter in your exact location and it will um, create uh, um, uh, an analysis uh, of, of the soils and what plants can grow there. Um, and then if anyone's in the Big Sky area, the uh, Historic Crail Ranch um, has a, a, a demonstration garden of native plants. Um, it's a small little space, but it's packed full of uh, Montana natives. So if you're in the Big Sky area and it's self-guided tour, uh, you can Google the, the address and location and um, have a little picnic out there, but it's a great little space surrounded by condos. So, um, and then the MSU extension, as other people have mentioned, has a great wildfire and drought resource page. And um, that can be another resource for people. Um, and as Linda mentioned, the water wise grasses on the Montana Native Plant Society uh, website under the landscaping tab is a great uh, resource um, that Toby Day and Tracy Dower from MSU and the Extension um, field studied, actual uh, field studied uh, native grasses for lawn use for turf. Um, so that's a great one. And um, uh, as Linda mentioned, the Valley of the Flowers chapters, our landscaping with natives is a little outdated, but it's a great resource. And also Helena has a similar packet that has similar plants that would um, relate to, to this area of, of Gallatin County. So thank you. 
All right, Shiva. Um, yeah, you guys already talked about many of my favorites as well. <laughs> um, I also jotted down bee balm for um, fragrance, deer resistance. It's rhizomatous. It's good at naturalizing. It's a good pollinator plant. Um, I really love echinacea. Um, I think it's kind of iconic and an essential pollinator plant um, and it's medicinal. I um, love nodding onion. A lot of the plants I chose have um, kind of an emphasis on deer resistance and really we tell people that no plant is deer proof because we've really just seen them eat everything and anything if they are determined enough but um, some of these tend to be more deer resistant. Um, and um, nodding onion is one I love. I just think it, it looks like a cute little fairy plant and um, it's also edible. You can sprinkle it on salads, which is nice. <laughs> um, prairie smoke, which uh, Beth just talked about is one of my absolute favorites. The, um, the color is unique and the seed head is really different. Um, it blooms really early. Um, alum root, which is a heuchera. Hugra cylindrica. This one is interesting to me because it's kind of, it doesn't have a particularly showy flower. It's kind of more of a subdued beauty, but I think it has really interesting leaves. And um, in the wild, you see it just like growing out of rock faces. And I, it's really adaptable to, like it can take all different types of light. Um, so I, I use that one a lot. Um, wild blue flax, of course, uh, yellow prairie coneflower, um, and I mentioned rosy pussy toes. Um, I think that's a really great ground cover if you're looking for a spreading ground cover. Um, and as far as resources go, I already talked about how uh, centerfornativeplants.com is a really good educational resource itself. And one of the um, things that I use the most is under our get gardening tab, there's a subheader called plant selection. And they, um, the nursery staff has over time come up with these awesome PDFs that break down species selection by category. So there's a PDF for drought tolerant plants. There's a separate one for deer resistant plants, a separate one for rain gardens, a separate one for deer or, um, shade, yeah, shade, um, bird friendly, medicinal. Um, anyway, I refer to that like almost every day. So I recommend it. <laughs> um, as far as books, I think a good starter book, it's not necessarily rel relative to this area, but getting familiar with planting design in general is the No Maintenance Perennial Garden, K-N-O-W by Roy Diblick. It's kind of an introduction into um, lawn conversions and how plants grow better as communities rather than individual plants, you know, plopped in seas of mulch or gravel. And then this is more like psychological, spiritual, but I think everyone should read <laughs> Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall uh, Kimmerer. That has more to do with native plant wisdom and its connection to native culture and the benefits of kind of connecting yourself to plants, be it through a forest or a veggie garden or um, whatever. Um, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> great, on to Giles. All right. Well, a lot of great plants are mentioned. They're all worthy of, of being Workhorse native plants is, um, you know, I'll, I'll add some, some ones that I, I like to use. I'll, trees, I've been really into five needle pines, the white pine and limber pine. They do well from pretty small. They can get, grow pretty cool forms. Um, for shrubs, we're about to have the service berries bloom on our mountains, our local hillside. So it's always really exciting for service berries. And they're the, you know, obviously the first thing that usually comes out besides the, the wax currents and, and things like that. So um, service berries, and they really can take a beating. We have a service berry that's in this like dry, dry, forgotten area across the street, grows along a fence and loves it. 
you know, it's meters tall. And, and so service berries, and I think mock orange, if we're talking about shrubs, mock oranges are, they just reseed like crazy all over the, all over the place. And, um, and they're one of our late blooming shrubs that smell really good. So in terms of the shrubs, you know, if we're going to go to grasses, I have to put in a, a big plug for prairie june grass. It is my logo grass, but it's also, it's the only representative of its genus in Montana, which is just awesome. You know, it's just like, so it's a solitary representative and, and it really holds, holds form for that. And it also is a tough guy. I think it, it's, it, it can take pretty low water and can be ignored. Most of the plants that do well in my yard do need tough love, you know, once established. I think that's one of the great things about native plants is they can take tough love. And I'm just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a, I kind of fly around with what native plants are the flavor for me of the time, but I've been really enjoying the Apache plume. And if you look at it, if you guys know what an Apache plume is, it looks just like a prairie smoke, but it's white. It blooms like multiple times a year. It's seed heads are the Dr. Seuss thing one and thing two hair, just like the prairie smoke. And it can grow meters tall and you can have it at eye level. So Apache plume is, and it's a really big, it's, it's pretty resilient too. And it's, uh, so Apache plume would be a, a new favorite, I guess. In terms of Forbes, I think ones that are, they can just be ignored and do really great in our late season or is a Maximilian sunflower. Maximilian sunflower once established is just the toughest thing around. It reseeds like crazy. And I have birds chewing, you know, gumming and harvesting those seed heads that over winter, I mean, all the, until they fly away, they're, they're harvesting those Maximilian sunflowers. So, um, so those are, I guess, some of my favorites. I mean, we all could go on and on about, about the favorite plants. I will say I'm just starting a native plant nursery called the Mount Jumbo Nursery. And one of the things I want to do is try to bring in native plants that, um, that are underrepresented commercially or by seed, um, but that do really well, like bracken fern. Bracken fern, I know it's a weed for some people, but it's a native plant that's like super tough and deer don't eat it and it's big. And so why isn't there more bracken fern for sale or for offering out there? Um, so that's one of the things I hope to, you know, to put a dent in. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, I hope um, the attendees are checking your chat there because they've shared um, a lot of websites and information for you that you can um, take notes on from the chat and or how to how to get in touch with people. I will say I forgot to uh -huh. reference. My reference is Peter Lessica. I don't know. <laughs> everyone should know Peter Lessica. He's the only reference you really need. He's uh, <laughs> he is my neighbor, it turns out. So I don't have to go far. But uh, Peter Lassica is, is all you need for your Montana yeah. native plants. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, that's the Bible. Yeah. All right. Um, so we had a lot of people pre-submit questions that were really excited um, to get their questions in back a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lot of, hopefully they've been listening and may have gotten some answers to some of their questions about um, certain plants and such or, or websites or where to learn about um, different things. But I'm just gonna start off, I'll, I'll read a question and whoever on the panel feels inspired, one or two or three of you can um, maybe go ahead and, and pitch in your, your two cents on it and we'll just um, see how it goes here. So the first one is from Sarah in Moscow, Idaho. And she's asking how to best add the good drainage that so many native plants need to the rich clay soils in our yard. Adding sand is risky as it comes with too many riparian weed seeds. Anyone wanna comment on that? Catherine, you need to unmute yourself. I don't know. Dylan? There you go. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, okay, so what I do, I live near the Big Hole River, and if you li live near any rivers, there's sand accumulates on the sides of the river and at the bends and everything. And I go down there and get sand, it's good sand, I know, and use that. Plus, I use gravel, also from the same areas. And uh, I lived in an area once that did have a lot of clay. And so I just had, I dug it in, basically. So 
and just try to enrich it with that and, and to make the drainage better. So, but then you can also plant natives that will grow in clay. So, you know, there are a number of natives that will grow in clay just fine. So, and I have neighbors here on the big hole that I've worked in their yards and with the clay and it's possible. So anybody else? Yeah, I, I, I am. I haven't had to work in clay. We have clay on the west side of town here and, uh, you know, I'm mending it, just trying to have a nice top surface to plant so the plants can take the good stuff down through the clay as they, as their roots grow down. So I always try to think of inoculum and um, it's just so much work to mix in any kind of sand or gravel or, um, so it's almost easier just to make a nice surface situation and then let the plants grow through. Great, thank you. All right, Janice and Bozeman wants to know, are there any secrets to extending the lives of native perennials that are known for short lives, such as Lewis's flax and blazing star? Anybody? Yeah, I'm, I don't think you can make a plant grow any longer than it, <laughs> it kind of is meant to grow. Um, those are kind of just short lived and they, I think it's because they bloom so long, they kind of just wear themselves out. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, you re replant or else I, um, you know, I just, yeah, kind of accept that about them. And flax really reseeds itself really well. Yeah, that's and usually what they do. Really well. And blazing star too. I mean, they'll come back, so. Okay. Just, they won't come back. They'll be growing again. They'll grow from new seeds. So, uh -huh. And uh, also from Janice, she says, I know the native plants are tough and one of their survival strategies is allelopathy. I know of only one native allelopathic flower, Maximilian sunflower, and she wants to know, are there more? <laughs> all the helianthus, all the sunflowers are allelopathic to some extent. And it, Max Millions is the worst uh, in terms of how far it extends from the plant. And I read about this because I really like Max Millions and I like nettles also, um, sunflower. And they said like with Max Millions extends at most 12 inches out from the trunk of the plant and they grow pretty big. And so 12 inches isn't really that far. I mean, you can have other plants all around it and it's not going to affect them. So you're not going to really see effects of that. Is what as you would opposed to say sagebrush, and then nettles is less, and almost all the others, um, even our native annual one, Anus has the same effect. has It has an allelopathy, where the where the roots are secreting chemicals that prevent prevent germination of other seeds around them. So basically, it's the plant strategy to get all the water it can for itself. So, but it's it's not that um, bad really. <laughs> so. All right. Lupin, Lupin is also a lelopathic. Ah, uh-huh. All right. So April in Whitefish is asking, uh, my husband would love to get rid of our terraced lawns to reduce water <laughs> and mowing. I do love the look of a lawn and don't want to replace it with a pile of rocks. What are some creative ways to make this look like a native plant scape? Um, and I think you guys have cited a lot of resources, but did anyone want to? Um, comment on that. You can comment on that because I do this all the time in terms of, <laughs> you know, the thing with grass and lawn grass is it's, it's really, it takes a lot of effort to dig it out and to scalp it, scalp the situation. Um, you know, for a lot of people that want new landscapes, honestly, most of the effort, probably 60 to 80% is in the preparation for the plants you want to put in. And, and so a lot of time, the easiest thing, depending on access, is to smother the grass. So if you put six inches of material on almost anything, nothing can grow through it, even if it's the, the Campanula, the garden cancer that we have here, or even some other aggressive, aggressive plants. You can smother them, usually with like a layer of gravel, and then you can put soil pep on top of that gravel and then plant into that. And that's the best way. Then you just have to manage the margins of the grass wherever it interfaces with whatever landscape's currently there. Um, so I, I, I'm a fan of smothering because you just save the step of all the, the labor of, of trying to take out what you don't want. All right, any other comments about 
that. Uh, let's see. Okay, Amy or Anne in Gallatin Gateway near Bozeman has a 10 acre field where she recently built. The ground has been disturbed. Weeds are coming in. The outer field is clean native, native grasses, which my neighbor has kept clean for years. I also seeded some wildflowers, blue flax and yarrow, which came back. How do I get help identifying what to weed when the plants are young before they go to seed? You just start learning, you start learning your weeds. And I mean, I know that from our, my own land here and there were things that were coming up there in the mustard family that I didn't even recognize, but I hand picked them all and eventually I got rid of them all. So, but it's just <clears throat> a matter of learning. And there are pictures that you can find online that show you the first stages, like the dicot, and when they first come up, they'll show you what they look like as opposed to some of the grasses. And some of them, like especially like with quack grass and those things, if you pull on them and they've got a really hairy brown looking hairy root system to them, they're grass, that's a bad grass. So you now you just start working with uh, what you have there and learning to recognize it. And it's a process, but I mean, that's the only way I know how to do it. So anybody? I think the NRCS has a, um, or the Gallatin Conservation District here in the county has people that can come out and um, assess your space if you haven't seeded already and they may be able to provide assistance on helping you to identify um, what are weeds. Um, as Catherine said, there's resources. You can go to the montanaweeds.org, I think, to- yeah to find the list of yeah, yeah. the noxious weeds on the state list and try and learn that way. But the NRCS has, is a great resource that people mm -hmm. should also utilize. They have, you know, yeah. program for pheasants forever that someone will come out and, you know, look at you. If, if it's a big area and you're wanting to bring in like birds or create deer habitat or other things, they're, they're a great resource. Great, great. Um, so Francis in Wilson, Wyoming says, um, our regional nurseries sell several non-native, often European species, which appear to, appear to be very similar to our local native species. Some examples are mountain ash, maple, nine bark, currants, and asters. What are the impediments mm -hmm. to growing and selling the native species instead of, or in addition to the non-natives? I don't see there's any impediments to it. I mean, no. it's just anybody can order from, from growers of native plants. Nurseries can order from growers of native plants and if, if they want to. Sometimes there's incentives for them not to do that because they can get cheaper prices from some of these huge growers like Monrovia and some of these other big corporates. But as far as getting the natives in, it's possible. It's totally possible wherever you are. Um, there's a good, uh, in our Native Plant Society site, as we've been talking about, there's been an update on sources and you can see all the different nurseries that carry native plants in your area. If you want more, you just have to ask them. They know who to call. They've been given the information. The information's right there on site and they need to see the interest in it. And as long as they don't see the interest in it, they're not gonna order it. They're gonna do what's really easy for them to do. And so we all need to be people that promote native plants. If you want native plants, you ask for them. You, you keep you know, a squeaky wheel thing and you can get them then. So um, I'd like to see more diversity of native plants available and that's possible too, but there has to be a, a, there has to be a market for them basically. And what happens is that a lot of the, the hybrids or the non-natives that we were talking, just talking about, there may be some aspects of them that may be more um, interesting to people, like more colorful, or maybe they, they keep their berries longer or something like that, or especially like with, um, mock orange, we have all these hybrids and different species of, of uh, mock or subspecies of mock orange out now that have bigger flowers that maybe they, they don't smell better, but they maybe they look better to the um, buyer. And so they're gonna go for those rather than going for the native mock orange. So you have to balance that out and say, which would I rather have? Your pollinators are adapted to, in your area are adapted to the natives in your area. And what happens with a lot of things that have come in, especially like butterfly bush and some of these things, they look great to the um, 
to the garden grower, but they, they aren't even attracted to the pollinators. The pollinators aren't keyed into them. So that's something that's really important to take into consideration. <clears throat> I, I could go on and on. I'm going to quit. No, no, here, here. That's good. Good points about the benefits of natives. Yeah. Um, so Angie from Bozeman says she's wanted to plant Rocky Mountain juniper in the yard. She thinks the birds favor it. Um, she's found it a bit challenging to find it without it being a cultivar. Um, how hard might it be to grow from collected juniper seeds? Anybody? I haven't ever done it. I've actually had yeah. a successful um, transplant with a tree spade. Um, mm -hmm. We transplanted mm -hmm. like 40 from one part of the ranch to um, uh, around the house. Um, and that was very successful. We also transplanted silver buffalo berry. I would suggest maybe the Bridger Plant Material Center um, they provide um, seedlings, I believe, and they may have, you know, it'll be small, um, but you could start small and watch it grow. <laughs> Was it the DNRC in Missoula? Who is it that the grower in Missoula? Yeah, isn't it the DNR? Yeah, Giles, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can get, you can get fairly good size um, bare roots from them and grow those. And they, they grow they grow fast if they're watered, so they grow really fast. So Giles, did you want to I have any Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, they grow fast. Yeah, it's still a tree, and trees are grow frustratingly slow usually. Um, mm -hmm. so that but trans Oh, we can't hear you. Yeah. Oh if oh, you are gonna transplant like a, a tree, you know, you, you don't want to kill the plant, and so usually. If it's in like a road cut or something that's mm -hmm. seems that's like a you know i think that's a safe area to get a transplant would be like a forest service road cut because they they'll come through and mow those down um you know event they're supposed to eventually and so you just want to make if you can't bare root it if it comes out bare root that'll work or you want to try to just get the drip zone and go try to go as deep as the plant is tall and so those are kind of rules of thumb for transplant all right, thanks. Um, D in Whitefish is asking about, um, she's got the box elder that provides summer shade for her house seems to be dying. What native deciduous tree species are good for planting not far from a septic tank and next to a building? This is a tricky one, I would say. <laughs> yeah. As far as native deciduous trees that our nursery carries, I mean, aspen and paper birch are what we have the most of, but I would not plant aspen in that situation. And you could consider birch, but um, up here, they tend to really love a lot of water. I think that's something to consider. Um, Is that too wet for a bur oak? No, actually, bur oak. Because bur I have bur oak planted yeah. right, by, right by our tank. and. It has a tap root, goes straight down, and it makes nice shade. Yeah, that'd be a good idea, or to consider maybe a larger shrub, something like Rocky Mountain maple. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, now we're up still up in the northeast part of the Flathead Valley. Kate says our land has very sandy soil. We would like to establish shrubs and trees for windbreaks and wildlife habitat. What tree and shrub species do you recommend? Is watering necessary to get them established? If so, for how long? And is mulching and or fertilizing recommended? Where was this? Up in the northeast part of the Flathead Valley. Will buffalo berry grow there? Okay. I think it will. Yeah. Lots of Willows, willows, willows is what I would oh, yeah, say. Willow. Elder, oh yeah, yeah. Elderberry would probably yeah. do would do well, yeah. and um, yeah, willows, you know, roses would be good, and things like that. Yeah, wild rose. You'll be sorry. Seem like they're going to need water though. <clears throat> they're going to need water for a while. <laughs> I don't to get established. Yeah, to get established. Yeah. And then buffalo berry flood them in the springtime. Yeah, and, and if it's really sandy, blooming, and then they'll grow. They grow great in sand. So, what yeah. about mulching or fertilizing? 
Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I think adding the top dressing is never a bad idea just for moisture retention and things like that. So it just depends on what the, what the mulch is and, and how, you know, they can keep an eye on it for weeds. All right. Here's one that asks about, about soil amendments. Um, Jan and Doug and Helena have some small patch of ground in front of their new residence. And they're wondering about soil needs and they wanna add some native shrubs and perennials. Um, there's a spruce tree out there and a few perennials, but they wanna attract birds. So they're looking at things like currants, gooseberries, dogwood, red willow. However, the soils these natives grow in would be so different than this landscape mix. What can you recommend for amendments, if any? Does that make sense? Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think that if they, it's kind of, I don't know, I like to be able to grow something without having to amend it where I live. And so, but where they are in Helena, um, they could even have like, I don't know, it could be like granite, granitic, you know, I don't know. So I think if they just started planting, you know, they might have some success with that. So I don't know what they really need to amend it. I mean, they just have to look at some things require uh, more uh, richer soils to it. Then, I mean, basically I have like sand, but if you live someplace that has some loam or something like that, to it, that has organics to it, you know, and some plants need more organics than others. But when you're talking about some of these shrubs, uh, some of our native shrubs, they do pretty good. I mean, without having yeah. a lot of commitment. I find that for a situation like that, the larger they go, like you can buy a 15 or 20 gallon dogwood. And if they're able to plant something that large, plants that large that come in pots are usually pretty resistant to stress, I find, while they're getting established. So my advice would be go big. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. As and also, you don't have to plan them. yeah. Yeah, we, so. you know, <laughs> we mentioned our website, we have specific, we have a Helena specific um, native landscaping yeah. um, PDF that's on the landscaping section of our, our website. So it might have more Helena specific um, information for Jane and Doug. I know um, one um, shrub, in the Helena area, wax current. I don't know if someone already yeah. mentioned Sarah. Yeah, that would be a good one for that area as far as berries for yeah. um, food. For birds. for birds. I love yeah. wax current. Right. Wax current is yeah. the only thing in our area that moose don't eat. <clears throat> really? it's incredible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's uh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I don't know okay, why. Well, I don't know. Too about oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say maybe choke cherry, but I think Choke cherry, you need to be careful with where you're planting it if you're okay with it naturalizing and suckering all Besides, over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. And another, someone else wanting to convert lawn to native meadow. So, um, same theme. But so, Katie and Helena says, what's the best way for a homeowner to convert a lawn to native meadow? And we've covered some of that. But she's asking, would this decrease the curb appeal for resale of the property? We might have different opinions on that. Um, and the prospect is intimidating, but I have so much lawn that sucks up water. So, Yeah, maybe, you know, start small. Like I said, you know, don't take all of it out at once, but just do little sections at a time and maybe put some of it into planting and some of it into like some seeding, native seeding. Right. You know, that would be my advice. All right. Uh, I would offer in terms of curb appeal that grass mm -hmm. will be a thing of the past before we know it. And yeah. those of us that started our native plant gardens yeah. now and they're established in 20 years mm -hmm. when the water wars begin, their resale will be higher than anybody's. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Um, and then another Niska is in Hot Springs and she's beginning the move, she says, from lawn to nature. Um, but she wants to know some suggestions for plantings, like maybe clover, she's asking, that could be seeded into the current grass, which is patchy and weedy, to help the soil recover. Something that she can mow and allow the cuttings for help. 
um, the, the cuttings to help um, for mulching. So any thoughts about that? Something to seed into current grass? Hmm. You could do white clover. I, I mean, it's not, yeah, clover, it's not native. Yeah, what you could do. Yes, yeah. it's not native and it's yeah, pretty no. aggressive. I, I wouldn't, I don't know. That, if that's, clover's not really a native way to go. No, it's not, no. Mm -hmm. I use a lot of prairie coneflower. I just throw it in and it just yeah. fills in those little gaps. You know, it's amazing. And mm -hmm. little bits of native grasses too, as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. All right, good idea. And then Sally says, how does one control native uh, wild roses? They spread like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that problem. Uh, I have that problem. <laughs> It's a hard, it's a hard actually thing. native rose they they pull out pretty easily you just have to have i actually have a pair of gloves that i use for like fire pits they're super thick and then i just go to town on the rose and you can just yank them out and just leave one stock and you know show it who's boss right. i put them rear yeah yeah and then we've got Linda in Missoula. Um, she's got this spot in her yard that she's been wanting to add a grouping of shrubs. It's near some spruce trees. It's been covered in bark um, for about four years. So it's mostly shaded. It just gets some morning sun and limited overhead rain. She's up in the rattlesnake, maybe by you, Giles. Um, and, but it gets really high deer traffic. Um, the purpose is to create more habitat for birds. So the question is, what are good native shrubs that are deer resistant, attractive, moderately sized, and do well with two to three hours of sun? Mm. <laughs> uh, wild roses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they like wild roses too. Yeah, yeah you know, it's really hard underneath the spruces. That's, that's so, a hard thing if you have a lot problem, of deer. Yeah. The only thing I grow under spruces are the Jacob's Ladder. Yeah. They grow underneath the spruces. They do pretty Juniper well. Grew, Juniper grows in the yeah, shade. That's right. Yeah. 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 But it's not the not the panacea that she wishes for. So would Oregon <laughs> grape birds, birds like, you know, is it a nesting and, and berries and stuff. So you know. yeah. I don't know about Oregon grape. I haven't had a lot of luck with that where I am. So uh -huh. I don't have enough Aww. organics. It needs organic. So Somebody in the comments just suggested snowberry, but um, yeah. Okay. Here's yeah. the last. Yeah. Here's the last one of our pre-submitted questions, and we can um, look at what the audience is up to. Aaron um, from Missoula says the Norway maples in our boulevard are dying. Any native species preferences for boulevards? Any experience working with the city tree people? In Dillon, we have our our city tree now is the bur oak. And they switched over to that because of the fact that it has a taproot. It's not prone to blowing over. Um, it has an upright growth form, so it doesn't have that the spreading oak form that where the branches break in an ice storm. So that's what we've gone over to. And they're, they're using both the regular burr oak and I think they're using a burr oak gamble oak cross. They're using some other cross too. And that's our tree uh, group in town. And we're a tree city, so. Mm. I want to know what the who's the tree guy in Big Timber. <laughs> you guys don't have probably a tree arborist. Missoula has a new tree person. The city arborist, his name's Ben. You know, if you have a, a boulevard tree, there's a pretty specific list that you have to refer to. They will provide you trees. The city of Missoula has a nursery, and they do they do give boulevard trees for replacement. I, I think they only have maybe a dozen different species, but they have a pretty good selection. And then there's another, um, you know, three dozen that you can pick from a list. Great. Well, that should be um, very helpful. So I'm going back in the um, audience questions now. And um, Alexandra, um, after listening to Linda, she asked about how best, and I think she lives over um, in the near in Sweetgrass County, how best to knock out brome grass and reseed with native grasses best on a 12 acre pasture? And by um, brome grass. Ah. That's a really hard situation. Um, without herbicides, if you don't use herbicides like Roundup to kill it, um, 
I, I honestly think the, about all you could do is just a lot of tilling, but that's just going to make it worse because it's going to keep, you know, cutting up all the mm -hmm. roots. Um, I don't, that's a toughie. Um, you might just have to kind of accept, again, what we've done sometimes with that is just do small areas where you kind of smother out some of the brome and then either by suffocation, like we said, mulching, if you want to go organically and then try to just plant in some flowers and, you know, native flowers. So at least you have some pollinators and some diversity, but it's probably one of the hardest things to get rid of that I've found. Even I, I did 30 acres um, where I, of, of, um, of seeded ground that was, well, it was like a, a grain, grain crop. And I have little patches of brome that have come back from probably 10 years, for, uh, you know, before that the, the grain was put in. Um, so it's an incredibly persistent plant. So it's a, that's a hard, I think all of it would be pretty daunting without some kind of major chemicals. <laughs> yeah. I know Peter Lessica's voice is ringing in my ear. I know he's, he's told me that the only thing that beats smooth brome in his mind is a shrub or a tree. Smooth brome is kind of the climax species for its, mm -hmm. you know, for, for of, among its kind. So um, so shrubs and trees might be mm -hmm. just planting some, mm -hmm. some good, you know, having some good areas and then working out from those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There um, are some perennials that will grow in Brome. I have seen them, some native stuff, but yeah, it's yeah. hard. Um, and then Connie, um, I think in reference to your mowing and, and such, Linda was asking, how do you time seasonal maintenance in a native yard with ensuring you retain environments for pollinators to overwinter? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed that. I'm, I did, didn't catch that. Well, how do we, we how do we time seasonal maintenance with ensuring you retain environments for pollinators to overwinter? You put it all in a big pile. <laughs> no, like if you're deadheading or if you're if you're pruning or doing all that. I just had this big pile way out back that we're all where all my butterflies and everybody else can overwinter. So. You can also you can also do your mowing in the spring too. Let's yeah. put yeah. it back later and do yeah. your yeah. Big mowing yeah. later. Yeah, it's just sometimes when there's a lot of heavy snow, it gets packed down so hard. Um, it's really hard to get rid of the grass if you don't mow it in the fall. So and you get fungal growth too. So yeah, I haven't really seen a big decline, and I've done these in a lot. You know, I haven't seen a big decline in pollinators. You know, I don't think that I'm really it's really hurting that I think they're figuring out a way to kind of coexist. Okay, well, we have only about another minute. There, there's still lots of comments and questions and, and such, but I do want to mention Patrick Plantenberg is our president and he said, can you please plug for interested people who want to join our Native Plant Society Landscaping and Revegetation Committee. And we we do, we, we've just had a period where that committee was kind of inactive and we have this overwhelming interest in native landscaping and native plants. So we're really trying to rejuvenate our committee to be able to do more outreach and help people. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, um, we're also at our annual meeting. If you're going to the annual meeting, there'll be a committee meeting for that committee there. But um, what would be the best way? I think on our landscaping page, is there something, or Linda, do you know, how would people, would they just reach out to you? Well, it, the, on, the on the website, it should have our um, our officers and stuff. And there, I think that, okay. is there a landscape committee chairman? Yeah, I, don't, I, I think I so. I guess that person would be the one to contact. contact yeah, that or it, it might be Patrick right now. So. Patrick, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, but you can go on our website and please consider um, getting involved because there's um, mm -hmm. there's so much interest and, and a lot of great outreach and everybody's trying to do good work. And the more we share, um, it's just it's just so helpful to everyone. So we didn't get to all the questions, um, but hopefully you feel more connected to our native landscaping community mm -hmm. and you have some new resources to investigate and help guide you. 
in your um, landscaping decisions. So again, I really wanna thank the panelists for um, taking time to be here. And then um, also um, thank you everyone for coming and we'll just um, go ahead and, and say good night. So thank Thanks, you so much. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.